Soteriology 101 podcast, where God is most glorified by his love and provision for all people. Welcome your host, the director of apologetics for Texas Baptists, an adjunct professor of theology and a local teaching pastor, Dr. Leighton Flowers. Welcome back to Soteriology 101. You can see I have a guest with me today. He's back with us, uh, Dr. Eric Hankins, who is the uh, senior pastor at um, First Baptist Church of Fairhope in Fairhope, Alabama. Welcome back, Dr. Hankins. Glad to be back. Um, I asked you to be on the program because you wrote, and I don't mean to give you a big head here, but you wrote one of the best articles I have ever written, um, really answering and critiquing the issue of the Calvinistic interpretation of Romans chapter 9 with re- with regard to the doctrine of reprobation. So, Thank you, one, for your work. Um, if, if you have not, as the listeners, if you guys have not read this article, I've listed it, uh, linked it on my, um, my Sociology 101 blog. Um, it's also on my Facebook page, and, and I have rebroadcasted it a couple, I mean, re-tweeted re, um, uh, it a couple times just simply because this needs to get out there. Um, one thing that the Calvinists are really good at, Eric, if you haven't noticed, is that they reblog and retweet and <laughs> they they sell the their leading scholars uh, material really really well and uh, and as far as I'm concerned you're one of our leading scholars on the traditionalist perspective and this is a really really well written article I appreciate your work on this I appreciate that I want to go over it with with you on the program because I know people as they read this they may have questions I hope that as Calvinists read this that they will come with an open heart and objectivity and really, really examine this. Um, you you, you kind of tackle this by really focusing on the writings of, of Wayne Grudem. Um, and right. I think that was really wise. For one reason, Wayne Grudem is probably one of the most recognized names uh, with his systematic theology being one of the most popular within the schools. Hasn't that been your, your experience as well? That's right. That's why I, I chose it. Um, it's, I, I'm, I don't know this for a fact, but my uh, uh, my assumption is it's the one of the main textbooks at all of our seminaries, hmm. uh, and certainly at New Orleans and Southwestern where I was, and I'm sure that's the case at, at Southern and Southeastern, and then beyond the borders of Southern Baptist life, it is just a staple. Yeah. I, I believe uh, his systematic is on the shelves of m- most seminary-educated evangelicals over the last generation, 500 million copies, I think, is what wow. I looked up and included in a footnote wow. for the paper. So it is. Uh, I chose it because um, it is the standard. Yes. It's really, well, a, it's really a standard for evangelical theology and certainly the standard for Calvinist. Right. Theology. Well, and, and a lot of times we can be accused of not representing uh, mainstream Calvinism well enough because there are fringes on in any group, um, and no one can accuse Dr. Um, I think Grudem of being a fringe uh, of anything. He's mainstream uh, as mainstream Calvinist as you can get, and so that's one of the the things I appreciated about this is that it's dealing with his actual writings and contrasting our views with his. Um, by the way, this is per, this is published in in the Journal for Baptist Theology and Ministry in the Spring 2018 version, Volume 15, Number One, uh, from from New Orleans. Uh, the articles, by the way, by the way, in this journal, all of them are worth your read. Um, mm-hmm. I especially, of course, just because of the topic of this one, wanted to focus on Dr. Hankins' article. But I encourage you to pick up this art, this journal if you haven't uh, subscribed mm-hmm. to it, because it's it's a worthwhile journal that you I know you will be uh, uh, challenged by. And I appreciate uh, Harwood, Dr. Harwood um, there at New Orleans and, and the others that put this together and, uh, and making it available to us. But l- let's just dive right in. Um, the, the title of it is Romans 9 and the Calvinist Doctrine of Reprobation. Um, and if, if we understand election correctly, according to Dr. Grudem, he says this. As a matter of fact, this is from your footnotes, footnote number one and two. You give a definition of repro- reprobation from the Calvinistic perspective. So this is not us 
saying what reprobation is. This is what a Calvinist says it is. Okay, so let that, I'm just making sure people understand that because I, I right. get accused quite regularly of not understanding Calvinism or misrepresenting Calvinism. So he says this. He says when we understand election as God's sovereign choice of some persons to be saved, then there is necessarily. I mean, that means you can't get around it. It's necessarily another aspect of that choice, namely God's sovereign decision to pass over others and not to save them. Um, and then you also quote Lorraine Botner, who's a well-known Calvinistic scholar, historian, who said, quote, the doctrine of absolute predestination, of course, logically holds that some are foreordained to death as truly as others are foreordained to life. Um, you also reference the fact, and, I, and I've quoted many scholars uh, showing this, uh, along with James Leo Garrett in his systematic theology, showing that both Augustine and Calvin and those following Augustine and Calvin most certainly affirmed that reprobation was a necessary implication of the doctrine of election from the Calvinistic perspective. Um, and so if, if that's classical Calvinism. That's in other words, that's what we understand as Calvinism 101 um, is the the doctrine of unconditional election of certain individuals, the passing by or the reprobation of all the rest. Then, how is it that some Calvinists attempt to say they're Calvinist, but then say they don't affirm the doctrine of reprobation? In other words, how are the more moderate Calvinists, especially in our own convention, the SBC? There's a lot of guys that hold to a lot of the Calvinistic claims, use a lot of the Calvinistic vocabulary, um, even claim and proudly wear the label Calvinist, but yet somehow they attempt to hide or get around the fact that they affirm reprobation. Um, is that, what, what's that like in your experience? Why is that happening? Yeah, I um, really see three strategies that Calvinists or Calvinistic people use when they are confronted with the doctrine of reprobation. The first strategy is, is just to deny it, just to say, oh, I, yeah, that's, that's a part of Calvinism that I don't believe. Uh, this is real typical of the, of the uh, poorly informed Calvinist who's adopted it because it's kind of a, they have scholars that they like or authors that they like, but they have not thought critically about the system. And so I call it cafeteria Calvinism. You just pick the parts of it that you like. And so and that flows into this idea of three-point Calvinism, two-point Calvinism, that sort of stuff. And, uh, and I would say, just to those who are listening, we've really got to stop accepting that. Uh, oh, if yeah. you're a three-point Calvinist, you need to stop it, yeah. okay? You're not a Calvinist. Or yeah. you need to adopt Calvinism, uh, and it's five points. Uh, I'll even give some room for the, at least there's a tradition of four-point or uh, um Amoraldian uh, Calvinism, but but really it's it's incredibly inconsistent. But I find a lot of conversations I have, it's just oh, well, I just I don't accept that part. And what I tried to demonstrate in my paper is that's a necessary part of the system. Yeah. And so that strategy one is just be just be internally inconsistent. I just don't like that part of Calvinism. Right. The second uh, strategy is a series of workarounds. Um, God has two loves, God has two wills, God's uh, uh, desire to elect is asymmetrical uh, in its relationship to God's desire to, to reprobate. Um, uh, salvation is all of God and damnation is all of man. Um, 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 oh, what's the one, one of the ones that I love is uh, equal ultimacy. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's this high sounding rhetoric that doesn't mean anything. Uh, God's relationship to, uh, or his, or his um, responsibility for reprobation is somehow different uh, from his responsibility for election. Right. Um, I, um, so there are those workarounds that are just, um, they're an attempt to uh, give a, a, a logical account for, uh, uh, for reprobation. But at the end of the day, all of, all of those attempts are logically contradictory. Yeah. Uh, and then the, the, the third strategy is just to accept that their system is logically contradictory. Uh, yes, uh, God is the cause of all things, but he's not the cause of people's, he's not the cause of the reprobation. He just simply passes over them. Um, and then they'll say things like, God doesn't have to submit to our logic. Uh, 
um, or they they won't uh, adopt or admit to the term logically contradictory. And so they'll say, well, it's a paradox. It's a mystery. It's antimony uh, uh, or, anti- excuse me, anti- antinomy. Right. Um, J.I. Packer, Spur- I think, uses that. Yeah, yeah, Packer, Spurgeon, you know, the two, two parallel paths that cross somewhere in, in eternity. Why should right. I have to reconcile friends? All that sort of thing. Uh, but that is just um, that's that's a failure to uh, grasp the the very clear and simple claim that we are making. It really can't be denied that Calvinism at this point uh, is uh, is uh, logically contradictory, or God really is the cause of evil. And there, that's where you get to consistent Calvinists or hyper Calvinists, which just say, yes, God causes the damnation yeah. of the non elect. Right. Uh, well, and it, it seems, well, and it's interesting if you Google uh, John Piper, he actually writes an article against J.I. Packer because J.I. Packer claims this is an antinomy and, and, and uh, Piper doesn't like that because he doesn't like to affirm logical contradictions. And that's one thing I like about uh, Piper. At least he's he's uh, one of the logically consistent kinds of Calvinist. And that's what, what that's kind of what I, I continually point out is that if, if you're going to call yourself a Calvinist, um, and then it, it seems to make sense that you would affirm the leading scholars, including the namesake, Calvin himself, with regard to their teachings on this subject. And up on the screen, you can't see this, Dr. Hankins, but uh, I'm showing it to the crowd here, to the audience, so that they can see it. These are two quotes that I use quite regularly to demonstrate uh, for those who don't think I'm representing Calvinism correctly. Uh, I, I got a quote from John Piper f- from his ministry website here um, and from John Calvin uh, obviously, John Piper being one of the most influential Calvinists in our world today, and of course, John Calvin being the namesake for the system. And in the quotes to this, John Piper says on his ministry website from Design God, quoting from a Mark Talbert's a book, he says, God brings about all things in accordance with his will. In other words, it isn't just that God manages to turn evil aspects of our world to good for those who love him. It is rather that he himself brings about these evil aspects for his glory and his people's good. This includes, as inc- incredible and unacceptable as it may currently seem, God's having brought about the Nazis' brutality at Birchewantnall and Yalshowitz, as well as the terrible killings of Dennis Rader and even the sexual abuse of a young child. John Calvin himself taught, how foolish and frail is the supported divine justice afforded by the suggestion that evils come to be not by his will, but by his permission. It is quite frivolous refuge to say that God otusely permits them when scripture shows him not only willing, but the author of them. And then Calvin quoting from Augustine, which by the way, Phil Johnson's the one who pointed this out to me because I'd been quoting this as from Calvin, but Calvin actually is referencing back to Augustine. He's in agreement with Augustine, but Augustine says this, and Calvin is quoting from Augustine saying, who does not tremble at these judgments with which God works in the hearts of even the wicked, whatever he will, rewarding them nonetheless, according to desert. Again, it is quite clear from the evidence of Scripture that God works in the hearts of men to incline their wills just as he will, whether to do good for his mercy's sake or to do evil according to their merits. Again, that's pretty, it sounds like equal ultimacy to me um, as defined because they're always real careful. No, God does not actively working evil into the hearts of, of the reprobate and evil into the hearts of, of men. God doesn't do that. He's holy and all these other kinds of quotes. But then you've got from Calvin, Augustine, from which this this is all rooted from Augustine in the first place, um, very clearly saying that God is the one who works into the hearts of man, even evil according to uh, God's desire and God's purposes, God's sovereign decree, which everything is ultimately uh, rooted in God's sovereign decree of all things, which is the cause, the decisive cause of all things, according to Piper, according to Calvin, according to Augustine. Um, I don't see how you can get around that and still call yourself a Calvinist. You, you can't. And, and one of the things that uh, Ken Keithley points out in Salvation and Sovereignty, and he's referring to uh, uh, Sproul uh, Jr., who just says it's, it's just a lack of courage from Calvinists at this point. Just you, you, the right thing to do is simply affirm what your system affirms. Yeah. God is responsible for the evil acts of, of human beings. And, and then what yes. happens, Dr. Hankins, when you or I um, come out and clearly show these quotes, we say all these things, what we're usually accused of is, well, you don't understand Calvinism. 
And, and I guess what they mean by that is that you don't understand our logically inconsistent, more modified view of Calvinism, right. um, and, and and therefore we have to we we have to kind of step off of the 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 true Calvinism and into whatever form of Calvinism they have adopted or adapted, um, and and try to understand where they're coming from. One, do we need to do we need to just call this logically inconsistent because that's what it is, and therefore dismiss it as a blatant contradiction? That's what if something is contradictory. By the way, in logic, if you prove something to be contradictory, you've proven it incorrect. You've proven it wrong. Correct. So you can't Correct. say I believe a contradiction, and then continue to say that it you're believing truth that that's like saying that's it's an oxymoron it's like i believe a lie i believe something that's untrue um to say I, I, you believe a contradiction um and and truth thinking christians cannot i think give that argument over to the atheistic world just to say hey yeah we we believe in a blatant contradiction that's right and i would i know that's not the subject of our conversation today, but I would really encourage those of you who are listening, you need to spend some time, do a little research and get very clear on what the difference is between that which is logically contradictory uh, and that which is mysterious or paradoxical. I'm not saying there aren't aspects of the Christian faith that are mysterious and paradoxical, trin trinity, uh, hypostatic union. Yeah. But those are, are in a different category of thing than what Calvinists are claiming. Calvinists yeah. are claiming for act that which is actually logically contradictory. And then you need to get yourself familiar with what are the implications of affirming something which is logically contradictory, because Calvinists will say, well, God just doesn't have to submit himself to our logic, that kind of thing. Right. right. If God can do that which is logically contradictory, then all knowledge collapses. If God can both lie and tell the truth, if something can be both true and false at the same time, then there is nothing to be known about God or God's world. Right. Yep. It all goes away. Yeah. And so the, it logic, log, that which is logically contradictory is, as you said, an impermissible move. It is actually wrong, false, yeah. which not is why, to be believed. Which is why Piper comes against even the J.I. Packers uh, of the world to say, no, we, we don't need to go there. That We're actually falsifying our view by doing that. Um, and, and so I, I do appreciate the fact that at least some Calvinists um, recognize that and, and therefore step right into the theistic determinism of the, the claims of their forefathers and the systematic itself. And, and I think that that's uh, uh, revealing in and of itself. You, you go on to write this. Um, let me read directly. It says, critically engaging this particular doctrine of Calvinism is important because reprobation lies at the very core of Calvinist sociology, and because it suffers from an acute exegetical, philosophical, and theological problems, if the dubious doctrine of reprobation falls, Calvinism will need a significant revision. In calling reprobation into question, I will focus on the very particular task of demonstrating that Romans 9 does not demand such a doctrine. And then on uh, down, you, you go on to say, moreover, Demonstrating that Romans 9 does not demand reprobation is significant because the main reason Calvinists give for affirming reprobation is that Scripture does demand it, that there is no other way to read such texts. Grudem says of reprobation, quote, it is something that we would not want to believe and would not believe unless Scripture taught it. Moreover, if we are convinced that these verses, specifically Romans 9, 17 through 21, teach reprobation, then we are ob obligated both to believe it and accept it as far, um, excuse me, as, as fair and just of God, even though it causes us to tremble in horror as we think of it. So w with that said, if you would just summarize for us, you know, I, I would encourage people to go read the article. Obviously, it only takes 15, 20 minutes to read at, at most. It's a, it's a good bite size, a very easy to digest. You might have to read certain parts of it a couple of times to really catch the flow. But I, I love that it's short, it's sweet, it's easy to read, but it, it really covers these issues. But just in summary for our listeners, why do you believe Romans 9 does not necessitate a, a, a doctrine of reprobation? Really, the logic flows, again, through the paper like this. Uh, as Grudem says, no one wants to believe reprobation. It is, it seems to run blatantly against the grain of the Scriptures and, and the character of God. Mm. And so Grudem himself says, we would not want to believe it unless 
uh, Rome, unless Scripture taught it, and of course Roman, and he says Romans nine teaches reprobation. Uh, but for really three main reasons, it's clear that Romans nine does not teach reprobation. Reprobation teaches uh, that God's uh, that God's uh, disposition to all unsaved people for all time uh, is that He determines their fate. Hmm. Romans nine is not talking about that. Romans nine is is the subject is unbelieving Jews. It's not God's ontological disposition to all unbelievers for all times. Romans 9, 10, 11 is about God's salvation historical disposition to unbelieving Jews in Paul's day right. and in Paul's context there uh, where he wants to go to Rome. So it's not, it's God's salvation historical disposition to unbelieving Jews. It's not for all time. Uh, it is temporary. Uh, and at, at some future point, that hardening will be, will be removed uh, and there will be a, 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 a jealousy that's provoked, and there will be a responsiveness on the part uh, of unbelieving Jews. And then, uh, thirdly, that Paul uh, is not writing that this uh, permanent hardening of unbelievers is the display of his justice. That's how Grudem would define reprobation. But uh, what Paul is doing is he is demonstrating how God's disposition towards unbelieving Jews is a part of God's plan to bring about a maximum salvation, a great worldwide Jew-Gentile salvation. God is not working so that lots of people are damned. Yeah. Uh, Paul is saying that God is working so that lots of people are saved. That's right. Yeah. Well, and if I were recapping that, let, let me know if I'm getting this this right. This is kind of a recap. Instead of taking Romans 9, and when you mentioned the an ontological reality of all humanity, in other words, if, if you're reading this from the Calvinistic perspective, you think Paul is describing, in a sense, the nature of all humanity from birth, that they are these God-hating um, types of, of uh, they resist and they hate God and they are hardened and blinded and cut off. And, um, and because of that, only those that God shows mercy to uh, in this supernatural, irresistible kind of way, are going to be saved, and therefore that's what Romans nine is kind of unpacking for us: is that um, that this 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 the, these people, all people, are in this condition like the Jews of Paul's day were, where they're hardened, they're cut off, they're 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 so sinful they can't even see; they're ever seeing but not perceiving; they're they're ever hearing but not really understanding, and that's the nature of every man from birth ontologically we're just created in that condition because we've you know inherited the the nature of adam from the fall and that's the condition we're all in and therefore the only hope we have is if god steps in with his irresistible grace to save us and if you have that premise going into romans 9 it does at times sound like that's what paul is saying in romans 9 but what you seem to be saying is instead if we approach romans 9 as talking about unbelieving israel that because they've rejected the teaching of the Father for so long, they've rejected Abraham, they've rejected Isaiah, they've rejected the prophets, they've rejected all of these things, they've resisted them for so long, suppressed the truth for so long, that now they have grown calloused and hardened to those things. And because of that, God has cut them off in unbelief, as Romans 11 clearly says. He didn't cut them off unconditionally for no apparent reason. He cuts them off because of their unbelief. And that cutting off of them because of their unbelief is not unconditional before the world began, and two, it is not unto certain damnation. It is actually a redemptive goal in mind that God has to accomplish redemption and the ingrafting of the Gentiles so as to bring about more salvation, not less. Um, would that be a good summary of, of the two that, different positions? Yes, that is, and, and, and maybe I can... Uh, uh, describe it in a, uh, from a different approach. What's Paul up to in Romans 9, 10, and 11? That's, that's really what, what has to sit at the very core of exegesis. Right. And so what Paul's up to is, he's, is that the problem that the, that the uh, Gentile believers in Rome are having is, is, is uh, the, in their experience, uh, their, their unbelieving Jewish neighbors who they are trying to evangelize aren't coming to faith. And they had this question, has God, get, has God just given up on them? Right. It's just they've had their chance, and now God's getting because they're not coming to faith. Uh, 
And Paul is teaching a gospel that saves Jews and Gentiles. But if Jews aren't getting saved, doesn't that call the gospel that Paul is preaching into question somehow? Is it, is it, is it the power of God to save Jews? And so in Romans 9, 10, and 11, Paul is answering the question of Jewish unbelief. What is God up to? And what he's not saying, what the, he's he, absolutely it's the opposite of reprobation. He's not saying, well, God just, yeah, there, there are some people God just has just written them off. He's, he's decided not to save them. So you're right, uh, uh, Gentile Roman Christians, God has just, he's just given up on these unbelieving Jews. Why, why would Paul be making that case? Why would Paul pray for their salvation as he says he does in Romans chapter 10? Why will Paul keep preaching to them as he says in Romans chapter 11 if Paul believes that they're a group of people that God's already given up on? Or a quote from Isaiah where God says, I have held out my hands to them all day long, like, right. as if right. God's wanting them to come as well. Right. Paul is making an argument for the continued evangelization of unbelieving Jews. That's the point of Romans 9, 10, and 11. Yeah. We're going to keep preaching the gospel in the synagogues to Jews. Yes. That's the point. Yep. The Roman Christians have a problem with Paul's missiology. Paul, why do you keep going to the synagogues? I mean, read the book of Acts. Were those, quote-unquote, successful outcomes in a, in a modern Western Christian view? No. We'd say, Paul, like, the, like I think the Roman Christians were saying, quit going to the synagogues. It makes a mess. It gets the Roman authorities all stirred up. gets the rest of us in trouble. Just quit going to the synagogue. They don't come to faith anyway. And Paul says, you have not understood God's plan, hmm. which is through this special people, He's going to keep his promise to Abraham to bring salvation to all the families of the earth. And the Jews play a central role in that. Their Messiah obviously plays a central role in that. And so here's what's going on. Jewish unbelief demonstrates very clearly how God does not save. He doesn't save by works. He doesn't save by ethnicity. Jewish unbelief pushes the gospel out into the world, just like the hardness of Pharaoh so the hardness of these unbelieving Jews causes God to be glorified as, yep. the, as the gospel is pushed out by their rejection. Uh, it opens up a way to the Gentiles. Hmm. It, it, so there's, there's now the, the Gentiles are invited in, and, 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 th and, and, and that is um, actualized and made possible through Jewish unbelief. And then God's not finished. The incoming of the Gentiles will provoke these Jews to jealousy uh, mm. at, 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 at some point in the, in the future. And then these unbelieving Jews will come to be um, grafted back in yep. uh, one to faith. Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll become, they'll, they'll believe. Yep. Uh, and all of that will be in service of God's great plan uh, to, to bring about a salvation of a, of a Jew and Gentile family of faith. Well, speaking of jealousy, um, I, I loved your focus on that particular point. In fact, let me scroll down here into the article where you begin to touch on that particular point. Um, it's you, you write this. You say um, the redemptive aspect of Jewish unbelief is further substantiated by Paul's employment of the jealousy motif in Romans chapter 10, verse 19, 11, 11, and 11, 14. In 1019, Paul quotes from the Song of Moses out of Deuteronomy 32, a passage that deals with the salvation, uh, the salvation historical necessity of judgment and salvation. In Romans 1019, Israel's jealousy is negative, but the eventual redemption promised by Moses allows Paul to shift the motif in a positive direction in Romans 11. Paul explains in verse 11 that Jewish rejection has resulted in the salvation of the Gentiles, which in turn will provoke his fellow Jews to jealousy, resulting in the salvation of some of them in fulfillment of Moses' prediction. Here, Paul can positively uh, just oppose, uh, just oppose the, the uh, provoking to jealousy and salvation. So uh, then you quote from a scholar there, um, and sa which says this, as in the Song of Moses, Paul believes that when Israel sees that God's favor has passed them over, and been given to the Gentiles, they will be provoked to jealousy in the sense of seeking to emulate, and they will then be saved in the same way as the Gentiles by turning to 
the Lord. And then you go on to write, in the Calvinist doctrine of reprobation, there is no possibility for jealousy over the salvation of others to be a gateway to redemption. If Paul's focus is on the Jews, not everyone, the current time period, not all eternity, in ultimate redemption, not settled rejection, then Romans 9 does not support the doctrine of reprobation. Um, I think this is a solid, solid point here. Uh, talk a little bit about the, this issue of jealousy um, and how this, this, this jealousy motif really disproves the doctrine of reprobation from the Calvinistic interpretation. Yeah, I, th- I think the, the point hopefully is, a, is fairly simple and easy to grasp. Is there any sense that a Calvinist would say that the reprobate will experience a jealousy that brings them to salvation? Because that's Paul's point. Hmm. These unbelieving Jews will see the incoming of the Gentiles. They'll be provoked to jealousy over God's favor for the Gentiles, and, and they'll believe. Does any Calvinist who affirms reprobation think that that's what's going to happen to the reprobate? Of course hmm. not. Hmm. The, the definition of reprobation is no way. They have no chance. They never had a chance. You know, you mentioned that it's from birth. It's not from, or it's from eternity. Hmm. Yep. No chance. Right. No chance. And so there is no jealousy. There's going to be no stirring of a desire that leads to salvation. That's not what happens to reprobate people. If, if it does, then the whole concept of reprobation is gone. Hmm. Hmm. And so, um, uh, it, it, it seems to me to be a, a sort of a knockdown argument. Yeah. Reprobate people aren't jealous to be saved. Yeah. Well, and, that, and th- th- this is something I've tried to highlight, and I think you did a really good job of this in Romans chapter 11, um, because in, in the first six verses, it seems he's talking about the, the remnant, um, which the Calvinist takes that as the unconditionally elected uh, people of the Calvinistic worldview. In other words, the remnant are the elect that have been chosen for no apparent reason before the world began. And well, I would just say, well, no, how do you know they were chosen for no apparent reason? It says they didn't bow knee to bell. That seems like a pretty good reason. Not <laughs> That seems a pretty good reason to, to, to right. for them to be the remnant. I mean, these are people right. who aren't even willing, even at, in, in the risk of being killed, they, they are standing against the leaders of their day and not bowing a knee to another God. These people, these people are standing in faith. It seems to be that Maybe that's the reason they're a part of the remnant, um, not just for no apparent reason. Um, but I think they've just taken some of the verses from verse 9 with regard to God's selection of Israel, and they're applying it systematically to to those folks to try to think, you know, try to promote this unconditional election concept that these people were were not bowing a knee to, knee to bell because God somehow irresistibly or effectually worked on them to make them resist that temptation and make them keep faith in God. But, of course, the text never says any of those things. Those are all just things they're reading on top of it. And you go on to write this, and this is, this is genius. I love this. It says, indeed, in quoting Romans eleven seven, Grudem hits at what I imagine is the main Calvinist exegetical objection to my reading of Romans 9 through 11, that Paul is speaking of elect and reprobate Jews, elect Jews obtain salvation, but non-elect Jews are rejected forever. Just like you said, it's an eternal rejection, right? So Paul's resolution, however, in Romans 9 through 11 to the problem of Jewish unbelief is not merely that God is preserving a remnant of Jews who believe. That is certainly part of Paul's answer given in Romans 11, 1 through 6. God has indeed kept a remnant of believing Jews, believing Jews. That's the key there. They are believing Jews, okay? That's the reason they're being kept. And then you go and say, but Paul's own faith serving as an example But what about the rest of the Jews, the non-remnant? In verse 7, Paul does say that these unbelieving Jews are presently hardened. However, in verse 11, Paul asks, and this is critical, concerning these hardened, unbelieving, non-remnant Jews who have been the focus of the entire passage, quote, did they stumble in order that they may fall? Question mark. The clear import of the question is, Are these presently unbelieving, non-remnant, stumbling over the gospel Jews, destined to fall permanently? Paul's answer to his own question in the strongest terms, absolutely not. God is using their missteps 
to bring Gentiles to faith in order to make these unbelieving Jews jealous, in order to include them in the fullness of Israel. In verse 14, Paul says his ministry is about saving some of these jealous, stumbling but not falling, unbelieving Jews, but, which, by the way, I love that you, you kind of list all of the descriptive factors of them as you're going through that because it just brings it all together. So these are, these are people who are jealous, um, uh, that are becoming jealous, but they've, they've stumbled but not beyond recovery. So you can't be talking about the remnant because they're not stumbling. Okay, you're talking about stumbling people here. So they're stumbling but not falling. They're, they're unbelieving Jews. That's why, why they're stumbling. Um, if the rest, again, and the, the word the rest here is in quotes, the rest back, this referring back to verse seven. So you got, on one hand, you got the remnant, the elect, okay? And then you got the rest, okay? And then from verse seven down, you hear Paul talking about the rest. And th- that is so vital to understanding Paul's intention here, because when you talk about the remnant over here and you talk about the rest over here, the rest for the Calvinistic interpretation has to be in reference to the reprobate, the non-elect, hated eternally, salvifically speaking at least, does not want to save them, did not provide atonement for them. That's who he's talking about when he talks about the rest within Calvinism. How right. can that be true if the rest, as you go on to write, the rest are permanently hardened? Um, if the rest are permanently hardened, you write, why is Paul bothering to preach to them? Why is he praying for them? That is exactly the thinking that Paul is arguing against here. In verse 15, um, still referring to the single category of presently unbelieving non-remnant Jews, Paul speaks of both their rejection and their acceptance. In verse 16, not only is the remnant of Jews holy, so is the rest of the lump of unbelieving Jews. The remnant root is holy, and so are the branches. Um, That that to me is kind of the nail in the coffin of the Calvinistic interpretation, because how in the world can you have contrasted the remnant, which are the non-elect within Calvinism, and the rest, which are supposed to be representing the reprobate, the stumbling, the unbelieving, um, but yet somehow these stumbling, unbelieving reprobate are possibly being provoked to envy and saved, are possibly leaving their unbelief and being grafted back in. How, How can they defend that? You got me, <laughs> and I, I haven't read a, a, a good defense of it. I haven't come across one yet that that seems to be uh, satisfying, um, because it it seems so clear. The the um, so a, a question is, well, have we how have we missed it all this time? And it's it's because for so long, even myself, I started with sort of Calvinistic presuppositions about what Paul was up to. Paul is answering this question, why are some people lost and some people saved? And then, oh, Jacob, I love you, so I hate it. I'll harden him, I'll harden. Ooh. But we, we never read 9, 10, and 11 together. We just yeah. read 9 and stop. And when you do a little bit of work, as I, as I try to do, to hold Paul's entire argument together, I think it's right that says uh, with, with Romans 9 through 11, you got it's like riding a bike. you got to keep pedaling all the way to the, end of, to the end of the argument or you'll fall over so yeah. you just got to keep pedaling because there t- to me there isn't any question that the, the the group that paul is talking about are unbelieving jews what's mm-hmm. wrong with unbelieving jews and that that's the group he's talking about in romans 9 they are esau jews they are they are uh ishmael people they are they're in trouble they're in they're in yeah. big trouble but he it's the same group that he's talking about in right. romans 11 it's right. the same group and yep. here's what he says about them. They're beloved. They'll be shown mercy. They'll be grafted back in. Hmm. Yeah. Well, and that, and that, I don't know what you do. And that makes, you and that makes perfect it. sense when you've got when you've got a group of people saying, hey, we deserve salvation because of who our granddaddy is. And Paul going, hey, wait, don't you know that uh, Esau's granddaddy is the same granddaddy you have? And look what the Edomites, look what happened to them. So God would have to apologize to the Edomites for rebelling against the promise and speaking out against the prophets. He would have to apologize to them if he doesn't treat you the same way, because it has nothing to do with your your who you descend from. It has nothing to do with your nationality. It has to do whether you pursue this by faith or by works. Um, if you're doing this through the flesh, you're not going to obtain it. If you do it by faith, you will. And the Gentiles, for the most part, they're they're pursuing it by faith and they're attaining it. And you guys, you're pursuing it through works and you're not attaining it. 
Um, that seems like the basic premise of everything he's saying here. And to walk away uh, really with an interpretation that God is narrowing mercy and narrowing grace versus widening it and broadening it, especially in the motif of all that Paul wrote and all of the New Testament, which is all about God's expanding of his mercy and spreading the gospel to all people and, and bringing salvation to every man, woman, boy, and girl. And this is to bless all the families of the earth that Romans 9 through 11, if interpreted from the Calvinistic perspective, would be flying in the face and going upstream against every other part of the New Testament with regard to what God is ultimately accomplishing in the widening of his grace and mercy to all nations. Yeah, and I would agree. And then even more specifically, I think Calvinists are, are uh, actually constructing an argument that's the opposite of Paul's argument in Romans 9, 10, and 11. They're actually making the opposite case that Paul is making. The, the Calvinists are saying Paul is making an argument that God just has, there's a group of, or there's a category of people, and God just gives up on them. Hmm. Yep. He, just, he just gives up on them. Yeah. Well, Paul's arguing against that. I, I can't see it any other way. I mean, I, I've always talked about how sometimes we see within the Scripture a duck or a rabbit, you know, like those pictures where you see two of the same pictures in one picture. And sometimes the Calvinist reads this and they see a duck. We read this, we see a rabbit. Um, and I used to see the duck of Calvinism. I used to think it was teaching reprobation and uh, unconditional election. I thought it was undeniable. It just seems so clear to me. The duck is obviously there. Um, and then eventually I saw the rabbit. Eventually I began to go, oh, okay, I can understand how the Herschel Hobbs of the world, the C.S. Lewis's, the A.W. Tozer's of the world, I can finally understand how these other robust, deep-thinking Christians can finally understand these texts and not walk away as Calvinist. Um, and even then when I was seeing both of them, I, there was a time there I kind of hung on to the Calvinistic interpretation just because I was already entrenched in that system. My friends were all there. That was just the thing to be. And I held on to that interpretation, even though there was a, uh, a reasonable interpretation um, and, and, and one that even made sense that was right there ready for me to grab onto. And, and it wasn't until I finally let go of the duck and took a hold of the rabbit, so to speak, and said, yeah, that's the way it is, that so many of the other questions I was having kind of came into focus and now, after 10 years or so of being out of that system altogether, it's really hard to see the duck at all. It's like, how in the world can, I, can anyone hang on to the duck when they really begin to walk through these texts verse by verse like this um, and, and begin to understand them? Um, and I've even, even after reading your article and in, in, in preparation for, for this um, interview with you, Dr. Hank Hankins, I kind of went and tried to kind of dig up some... Uh, some of the commentaries on especially Romans 11 from some of the leading Calvinists. And it's, it's really, it's funny. It's, it's like they, they've become so vague about how they define these things. Um, James White, in, interestingly enough, in his, in his uh, kind of commentary on this, he actually refers back to a corporate view of election. In other words, he says, well, Romans 11, well, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta interpret that corporately. Now, individually in Romans 9, and he gets mad at people who try to use the corporate view of election in Romans 9. But then he goes, but it shifts here in chapter 11. It's clearly a more corporate uh, approach, which I want to say to them, okay, aren't corporations made up of individuals too? So isn't of the corporate group that's stumbling, aren't those who are stumbling within that corporate group obviously stumbling because of unbelief? Aren't they obviously being cut off so as to be grafted in back in because of their unbelief in the first place? How do you get around that? And um, I have not, like you, I have not seen um, a, a clear, rational, um, exegetical commentary on especially chapter 11 that supports the Calvinistic rendering of chapter 9. Yeah, I, I understand that um, Calvinist exegetes have a hermeneutical grid that they, we all do, and we all need to be uh, we need to understand that. I think another mistake that's that's uh, frequently made in the the whole debate about Calvinism and non-Calvinism or Calvinism and traditionalism is, man, I hear people on both sides say, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, we just need to get back to the Bible and understand the Bible. All this discussion of philosophy is misplaced. I'm telling you, we, we're all doing philosophy. We all bring our presuppositions to the text, and we just need to be rigorous about 
first of all, what are they? What do I actually believe about how the world works and how language works and, and, and what is the nature that, that makes things things? We need to have that worked out in our minds. And then we need to take responsibility for them. We need to we need we have to be responsible for all the implications that flow out of that. That's what's so yeah. galling to me about Calvinists. Just mm-hmm. take responsibility for your philosophical philosophical system. Yeah. Yeah, be it, consistent. It's determinism. And so it, 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 it really necessitates some certain beliefs about God. Own it. Yeah. But you don't get to punt uh, when it has things that you don't like. I don't get to. I have to give an account for what I believe. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's a part of the theological task. And here's the deal. When your system kind of runs out of gas or it runs out of explanations, it can't account for data, then, then, the, then the, uh, the intellectually robust response is to make some changes. Yep. I agree. I, I think that's well well said. Um, you know, one other thing while, while I was kind of reminiscing about my former Calvinism, um, it reminded me of going to one of the founders uh, conferences back when I guess I was in my early, uh, my late 20s, I guess, uh, mid, mid to late 20s. And I went to one of the founders conferences and they were preaching on Romans 9. It might have been Ernest Reisinger, or is that his how pronounce his name? Remember him? It seems like he was speaking uh, as part of the founders ministry. And um, I remember it was a, he had a standing ovation. He said something to the effect of, "If if Romans nine is not teaching uh, Calvinism, then why is the Arminian objector in and throughout Romans nine? In other words, their entire argument was saying that the objector, the interlocutor, as he's referred to, because Paul uses a, a, a literary device called diatribe, which means he's anticipating what his readers are going to think. And so if the reader is objecting to Paul and his theology by saying the same things that, Cal, that, that the Arminians are saying, the non-Calvinists are saying, then it must prove that Paul was a Calvinist and was teaching Calvinism. And, and so... The interlocutor, this objector in Paul's mind, is that objector someone who's objecting against the doctrine of reprobation? Because that's what they're ultimately saying, is that God, that, that this interlocutor is objecting against this idea that God has ultimately ordained from eternity past that certain people will not be able to put their faith and trust in God Um, that they will be born in a condition that they can only hate God, that's all they will ever want, and that this is a a demonstration of his justice through their reprobation and their condemnation, Um, and that the interlocutor, the objector, is objecting against those who who don't like that doctrine. So you're just like the objector in the mind of Paul if you object against Calvinists. How would you rebut that kind of argument? Yeah, and again, it's a we we can have an XGL discussion about who the objector is, and I, I I think there is a you know you do have to do some exegetical reconstruction at that point because Paul doesn't say the here is the identity of this person who's raising these objections, but it seems clear to me, especially if you look at the same, because that the argument of of Romans nine mirrors the argument of Romans two and uh, two and three. Um, is the person who says, wait a second, God's made all these promises to these Jews to save them. Is, is it fair that all of a sudden they're not getting saved? And this doesn't, we're talking about God's righteousness here. God's part of, and, and, and the, the core of God's righteousness is his ability to keep his promises. He said he was going to do these things, and now he doesn't appear to be doing them. Hmm. That's not fair. Yep. And Paul says, first of all, God does get to save and, and bring about salvation the way he wants to do it. And he's decided that he wants to use the Jews in this way to bring this worldwide, everybody pulling in kind of salvation. So, yeah, right. it, it seems like kind of a weird plan to us that God would, you know, work, you know, pick a people and work through them to save the world. Hmm. Yep. And it seems surprising, and Paul's agreeing, I think, to a certain degree, you would have expected, and I think Paul would have expected early on to go into these synagogues begin to reason with these Jews. This is your Messiah. And I think we agree as Christians, man, you go through the Old Testament, how can they not see it? Yep. You know, everything seems to be pointing to Jesus. He's the fulfillment of all of these uh, prophecies, but they but they don't see it. And so I think what Paul is saying is the expected outcome that Jews would just flock to the gospel and flock mm-hmm. to their mm-hmm. Messiah. They're not. But Paul says, while this was initially a surprise, then I started working my way back through the history of Jewish 
response to the to their God and to the, 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 to, to the way God is working out his promise to Abraham. And, 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 and Paul says, what do I find? But a history, a long history of rebellion and resistance and rejection and missing the point. And God has this amazing way of working through that rejection so that his plan to save the world isn't, isn't thwarted. It's actually sped up yeah. and enhanced yeah. uh, by, by this. And so that's, I, I think the objection is, is God treating the Jews fair? Since the whole argument is about unbelieving Jews, yep. then t- to me it would stand to reason that the objection is God doesn't have the right to treat the Jews this way. Yeah. And Paul says, actually, uh, the, the Bible says that he does. Well, I, I love that you brought in, as N.T. Wright does too, uh, Romans chapter 3, the first 10 verses of Romans chapter 3 about where it is, because that, that, that's where the objector is introduced. And the objector clearly there is the hardened Israelite, who's um, which he he pretty much lays it out. He says, um, yeah, "How are you to blame me if my unrighteousness brings out your righteousness more, more clearly?" It sounds like something Pharaoh could have said, because mm-hmm. Pharaoh could have said, "Hey, well, my my being hardened and holding on to the slaves actually demonstrated your power like ten different plagues." I mean, obviously you're using my unbelief to bring about your glory. So why are you blaming me? I mean, I'm I'm doing you a favor here, God. Look, you're using this for a good thing. How can you blame me if you're using my unbelief for this positive thing? The Jew could be asking the exact same question. Mm-hmm. God, you're hardening me in my unbelief. You're 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 giving me over to my calloused um, self righteousness, the following of the law, and, and you're and you're speaking to me in parables. You're you're keeping me in my 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 um, my my condition at least for this time. Um, and yet you're doing it for a good thing. You're bringing redemption to the world through my crying out, crucify him. You're, you're bringing about the, the engrafting of the Jewish nations, the Gentile nations, through, f- through my unbelief. Um, how in the world can you blame me if you're doing that great thing through my unbelief? That sounds like the objector to me. Um, and it makes so much more sense of the entire context of this passage versus this concept and idea get your head around this, that from birth, most of humanity are born by nature, haters of God who cannot do otherwise, and yet God sends them to hell for something they have absolutely no control over. And if you object to that doctrine, then somehow you're objecting to Paul. That yeah, just I, baffles I just think me. If, if Paul were sitting here, he would just be astounded. I, I do. I they, think, how, in the, yes. how did they get that out of what I what I was saying. And of course, I think all of us who preached have had the experience of someone coming up, to come up to us after the sermon and saying, well, I really agreed with what you said about da, 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 da. And my thought is, mm, that's the opposite of what, <laughs> what I was saying. How did you, how did you, you, not, you weren't don't. listening. You weren't, you weren't, you, you just didn't follow my argument. And I think that's Paul, what Paul would say is you've just, you, you guys, you missed, you missed the point. Yeah. You of, missed it. Of what I was laying out. Well, brother, keep writing. Um, I, I just encourage you. I know you're a pastor, and I know pastors are incredibly busy. And I know it probably took you uh, quite a number of hours uh, in your spare time to to pull all these resources together and to do this. But um, there are not a lot of uh, deep thinking PhDs um, in the traditionalist world that I'm proud of, in the sense of saying, "Hey, go read this guy or go read that guy." There's, there, you know, there's a Dr. Allen's, uh, Dr. Harwood's, uh, Malcolm Yarnell's. I mean, there's there's a, there's a number of them. Don't don't get me wrong, but but they're far and few between, and they're not they're not megastars um, in our world today, like the John Pipers of of our world. And and I want to change that. I, I want people to know. Um, David Allen. I want people to know who, who Eric Hankins is. I want people to know who Malcolm Yarnell and 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 Harwood and and Braxton um, Hunter and these guys who are putting out great material that's not Calvinistic bent that doesn't have the baggage of of quote unquote tulip all over it, but instead is deep and it's robust because right now it just seems to me. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it just seems to me. That the dichotomy being painted in our world today is either it's the seeker-sensitive Joel Olstein, Namby Pamby suit for the soul kind of nobody wants to do theology kind of of a uh, thing on one side, or you're a Calvinist on the other th- other side who's deep exegetical, um, you know, verse by verse commentary, uh, you know, robust kind of preaching um, on the other side, and that's that's your two choices. 
And I'm just saying, no, enough is enough. There is time. It's time for traditionalist and for traditional theology to step up and say there is a deep, robust theological answer um, offered by men like in the past of the C.S. Lewis's and the A.W. Tozer's. Um, the, the, I would say um, N.T. Wright, though, I don't know if he would want to be included in our camp or not, but a lot of the stuff he's reading, I'm going ding, ding, ding. That sounds <laughs> like it's theological to me. Um, and it's interesting, you and I were having a phone conversation, and, and I wanted to bring this in because I, I thought it was interesting how you really highlighted that that N.T. Wright is not a systematic theologian. That's been your study. You 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 came from a systematic background, but he is a just a verse by verse, you know, New Testament guy. Um, talk about what we did on, on on the phone, if you don't mind, because I think that was real valuable to me to understand the way that N. T. Wright, even though sometimes he even refers to himself as kind of the Reformed tradition um, and those kinds of things. I mean, he's kind of in that. In other words, he doesn't hide from the fact that he he's connected in quotes from Calvin or some of these other groups all the time. Explain how that is that from from a, a New Testament scholar perspective like N.T. Wright is versus a systematic, how it is that they can still kind of cross-pollinate between the two groups? Yeah, I, I think the the distinction is one that we all understand, and it's one that I think Wright, as a, as a member of the, of, of the academic guild, is, is appropriately careful about, which is he is a New Testament scholar. That is his training and background and area of study. And so he that there are times when I, I think everybody wants to pull him into making larger declarations about about systematic doctrine and my sense is he tends to say i'm really just talking about paul that's my Very that's focused. what i'm up yeah. to that's what i'm qualified uh, to speak on now what you systematic theologians do with the, the exegetical work that i've done i you know get to work uh, yeah. but I'm, I'm, I takes all of my time and energy and focus and study just to articulate some things that Paul's been saying. I think what Wright will say is now there are times when it's clear that what I'm saying Paul was saying is not what Luther was saying Paul was saying, but that's not my problem. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not a so, Luther scholar. So we're going to continue to be reformed. I have to defend right. or prop up Luther or Calvin or Augustine or any of the rest of them. They, they're, uh, 500 to 1,000 years to 1,500 years after the my area of interest. Yep. And so uh, I'm dealing with Paul. I think where that circles back to people like you and me, the evangelicals and Southern Baptists, is, is, we, is we're quite a bit more serious about Paul than we are about these other figures that I named. Hmm. And uh, the other challenge I get, and this is sort of parallel to the discussion of N.T. Wright, is with Calvinists, they will say things like, well, that's not what Augustine says, or that's not what Calvin says, or, or you're, you're departing from you know, some central claims that Luther makes. So? Yeah. <laughs> uh, my early days in getting my into this, I would say, well, I don't care what Augustine thinks. And people were horrified, horrified <laughs> that I, was, didn't, I didn't care what Augustine thought about something. I don't also think he was wrong about uh, baptismal regeneration and, and persecuting heretics, and on and on and on the, the list goes. Yep. Um, uh, but to, to your point, um, our, our process needs to be, we need to be clear first and foremost about what Paul is talking about. And then from there, we've got to deal seriously about what the theological implications are. And as we've always done in a good Reformation tradition is we, we get serious about what the Bible says, and then we let the chips fall where they may. And that's back to just, I'm, I'm speaking specifically about, about Baptist tradition. That's, that's us. Yep. We've always just let the chips fall where they may. Yep. Hey, we're going to we're going to baptize believers. Well, we'll yep. cut your tongues out. We'll drown you. We'll we can't have jobs. We won't give you the ability to preach. Uh, we'll run you out of our countries. And as Baptists, fine. So. <laughs> <laughs> because come at me, we're bro. What the Bible come, says. come at me, bro. That's yeah. Kind of the thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's that, and that's yeah. Baptist and especially Texan. I know in Texas we're just like, yeah, hey, yeah, come, come take them, come take mm-hmm. my gun, you know, come take, mm-hmm. to try, you know, try mm-hmm. to try to take. Well, and that, and I think you make a great point. Disagreeing with Luther is no, it's no different um, as far as his spirituality as disagreeing with John Piper, um, or just because he's five hundred years ago doesn't make him more spiritual or more right. Um, you, you know, if we do believe in sola scriptura, if we do believe that that the the, the scripture alone is our authority, then that's where we need to be going to. And that's one of the things I appreciate about 
N.T. Wright is he doesn't go to a systematic. He's trying to be as, as, as I think, honest with the original meaning of the text as he can be, regardless of what uh, where, where that lands him systematically. Um, in other words, I want to base my system upon the, um, <laughs> the New Testament uh, meaning of the words, not, a, not, a, not on the consistency of that system. Um, and that, I think it's a healthier approach to uh, biblical theology um, and, and establishing some of these things. And, th- and that's one of the reasons I think you see men like you know, Spurgeon and others that we have a lot of respect for um, who quote almost as many quotes in favor of our theology as is in favor of the Calvinistic theology. And clearly he, he came out and, and proclaimed to be a Calvinist and, and, and had many teachings and doctrines that are very Calvinistic leaning, but he also has a lot of them that fly in the face of Calvinism. And, and, it, and it seems as if maybe that's due to the fact that he's also more of a verse-by-verse guy, uh, more of a biblical theologian in, in, in instead of a, a systematic, and therefore some of the text that he's covering sounds like he's coming across more Calvinistically than others. Um, but I, I think that there's a healthy balance in having those kinds of discussions um, and, and looking from a biblical perspective and saying, where does our systematic need to adapt um, what, what do we need to drop, especially if there's some blatant logical contradictions within our systematic? Um, and, and, and I think this article, as well as, as um, uh, many other writings, kind of go to demonstrate how the Calvinistic interpretation is not only not necessary, but if logically applied, contradicts itself and can't stand. Right, and contradicts Scripture. Right, Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to be on on the program. Um, we could go on and on. I think uh, you and I, the kind of theology geeks that like to just sit around and talk theology, and we could probably do that for uh, hours on end. But uh, as you even mentioned before, sometimes the brevity uh, is, is is better so that more people can kind of take in this information. If you have not read this article, go grab it uh, out of the, the Journal uh, for Baptist Theolog- Theology and Ministry out of New Orleans um, and uh, and spread that around. Retweet, rebroadcast, re, uh, put it on your Facebook feed. Whatever you got to do, get this out there, and let's let's get more people engaging with some deep, robust uh, theological articles from the other side of uh, the theological aisle, so to speak, and uh, allow them to know more about um, uh, good scholars like Dr. Hankins. I think we need to get that that word out, and I appreciate you, Dr. Hankins, for taking the time to be with us today. I'm glad to do it, and and let me say on the on the article, my email is listed. I really. For, for you listeners, if you read it and have some questions, I mean, that's my only email address. Uh, that's, that's my main email address. And so uh, send those questions on to me. I'd love to interact with you. And, and uh, if you've got some critiques, if some of you are Calvinists, great. Uh, love to hear from you. And um, uh, the, the, the whole uh, process of, of theological construction is a conversation. Uh, and so I'm, I would love to hear from you if you have any questions or insights for me. And that uh, email will be put in the show notes for those that want to see it. it it's yeah. also there on the screen for those that listen by audio. It's ehankins at fbcfairhope.org. Um, and he means that when he says it. Now, it doesn't mean he, he, might, he might take the time to reply to all of your, your critiques, but, um, but if you've got some deep questions or some things that you'd like to, to grapple with, then feel free to, to reach out to Dr. Hankins. I appreciate you you're making yourself available that way, my, my friend. Glad to do it. Blessings to you. We'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye. Great. Back.